this power hour, we are going to talk about leadership and entrepreneurship specifically when it comes to um, psychology of success. And we have great people uh, with us here today. So Jennifer has already introduced who is who. Um, Olivia uh, is here as well. So she's based in Shanghai. She's also in the marketing space, also business owner. And uh, I think we will, because the room is already so full, it's uh, so refreshing to host it from actually a club. So we don't need to wait for people to join in. We're going to jump straight into self uh, introductions. And let me quickly run you through how today is going to go. First of all, all of us here on stage are going to introduce ourselves for just one minute. Um, and we're going to do it this style. A very quick few sentences about who we are. And plus, I would like us to share one thing that we've learned on Clubhouse within this past couple of days or past couple of weeks. So our biggest lesson, something that we've heard, something that we connected, and something that really impressed us. Okay, so this Actually, will be us. do you mind if I go first? Because I have to go sure, open another sure, room, Jen. but I'll be back. I'll, I'll have to open another room in another club really quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's do that. And uh, guys, just so you understand, then we will go to a couple of questions here on stage. And then as the third section, we are going to open the questions to you where you can raise your hand and actually join our discussion. So Jennifer, please do start a quick intro and what have you learned on Clubhouse recently that impressed you? Sure. So I'm uh, Jennifer Chang, um, born in the US, um, came to Hong Kong for business school and stayed, uh, serial exited entrepreneur and uh, investor. Uh, now I also do direct investments and allocations for my family office. Uh, and we focus on impacting ESG. Um, had an IPO two weeks ago on NASDAQ for a cancer vaccine, was really excited about that. Looking forward to um, potentially two more IPOs coming up soon. So I'm um, quite busy. Uh, wow, the um, thing I most love about Clubhouse, um, I think it's actually um, reuniting with old friends because um, the, the, I actually, I, I have now a practice. Sometimes I have rooms where I moderate and then I collect some of the moderators that I want to meet each other in real life. And um, then there'll be like a bunch across different time zones and literally the room will be six hours. And my whole point for having the room was actually to have my friends from different countries meet and uh, mission accomplished because sometimes we have these amazing discussions with other people in the audience and everyone comes up and the flow is so amazing. And um, some of the rooms, uh, one room went on for 18 hours and uh, now we've now uh, decided to do just weekly rooms and commit to that. Um, and uh, and I'm also quite excited that uh, Clubhouse has been able to bring my real life introvert uh, friends out of, the, out of hiding too, like uh, Vivian here, who's uh, my best friend. Woohoo! Exciting. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Awesome stuff. So, Vivian, would you like to go next? We're going to get your introverted self out into the light and on stage. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, I'm Vivian Wang. I'm from mainland China. I'm based in Hong Kong. So, um, I'm also an investor from New Street Capital um, with Jennifer. Um, I also run my own pop trading firm, uh, ASSM Management. Uh, Jennifer gave me the idea of the name. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so for for my trading, I invest in public uh, equities. So our style is magazine. Uh, tech is one of my favorite sector. We seek alpha and we do our momentum trading. And I also um, advise a number of listed uh, ch Chinese companies that are listed in Hong Kong and US. Um, that's all about me. And what I learned uh, at Clubhouse, I, I'm pretty new here, um, is the new ideas because partly I've been China and Hong Kong focused. So recently I've been like learning new, like entrep like new startup ideas from people from all over the world. So that's very interesting. This is awesome. Um, thank this you. Awesome. That's all for me. Thank you so much, Vivian. Cool stuff. Um, shall we go uh, into Olivia? I see you next here on my screen. Hi, how are you? Hi, hello. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> so my name is Olivia. I'm from the US and I have been based in China for the past six years now working in marketing. Um, I currently run my own social media marketing agency uh, with a team outside of Shanghai, but I also serve um, as president of a nonprofit women's organization. So it's uh, an organization that's been around for 28 years in Shanghai. And we 
organize um, offline events regularly um, to help connect and inspire professional women in Shanghai and China and really all over the world. So I'm so happy Ashley has organized um, this room tonight and I'm excited to talk about your questions on women's power in China. Super awesome. Kim, would you like to go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to say a shout out for Olivia's work with IPWF in Shanghai is one of those key organizations that really helped me get grounded as a female founder in Shanghai. So I moved from the U.S. to Shanghai about 11 years ago. Um, I recently sold uh, my first startup, Park Loop, to a global marketing company called Lunch Metrics. So I've been spending the latter half of this last decade focused on China cable marketing. And I have to say, I've learned a lot in Clubhouse this last week. Um, I'm particularly interested in learning about B2B SaaS and sales culture. And one of the conversations I uh, tuned in on said, you know you're doing something right in sales when you're doing something that makes you uncomfortable. And so that was an insight that I walked away this morning truly inspired. So gorgeous. Jen? I would just like to first off say that Kim has inspired me <laughs> in my decade oh, running up yeah. China. <laughs> so I want to acknowledge that. Um, hey, my name is Jen. I'm um, Shanghainese Canadian, actually. So um, both sides of the Pacific Ocean feel like home, if you will. Um, but I spent the last decade running around um, Shanghai, Hong Kong. I've lived in Bali, Kobe, um, and am very excited to move to Singapore at some point this spring. Um, my background, um, I'd say I'm, I'm a proud, failed entrepreneur <laughs> um, and, and took a lot of uh, lessons in, in why that might not be for me. Uh, but I've since then um, gone into VC and actually try to help um, founders um, to grow their businesses. Um, prior to that, I uh, was mostly in retail, um, setting up Lululemon and Tom's into China, and also spent some time at uh, Rocket Internet, which is where I crossed with uh, Jennifer, actually, in another life. Oh, and awesome. and um, yeah, go sorry, ahead. For, for what I learned that, uh, from Clubhouse. So I kind of, um, I, I feel like I have a fatigue from um, work-related discussion. So I, I, I sort of use this platform to really dabble in interests that I probably would be too shy to go to a conference or go to an offline event for. Um, there's, there's tons of like amazing book clubs, public policy type discussions. And then recently there's this guy called um, Yo Chanting. I think that's his username that he does a beatbox uh, Japanese Zen meditation music. So um, just dabbling into these interests that I think normally work wouldn't really bring me to. I, I think that's what's uh, really refreshing about this platform. That's so gorgeous because uh, it's so fun. Everybody on the platform here on our panel today actually somehow know each other either directly or through friends, friends of friends or worked together or followed each other for a long time. And I think this is the power of Clubhouse, just bringing people together really in one space. And I'm going to start with something that really stuck with me this week on you know, Clubhouse was there was this guy talking about who you follow on social media becomes your future thoughts. And this is so true. And I believe that, you know, watching media, for example, if you, if you always watch news that are super negative, you are going to be in constant stress. But then when you put it um, in terms of the follow, you following people on social media, or you listening to rooms on Clubhouse, and these people become your future thoughts, then I think, uh, yeah, that um, was very, very interesting for me. And I am Ashley. I was born in Russia, in the Soviet Union. And uh, essentially, I moved to China when I was 17 and started my own business about uh, 11 years ago here in Hong Kong. And uh, I run an agency and I run a training company focused on the China market. Um, about four or five years ago, I also started uh, studying psychology, specifically in the context of succeeding in business and in leadership. So today, very, very excited to run this room. Um, ladies, we also have Kelly joining us here. Kelly, are you on the panel with us today? How are you? <laughs> Um, Vivian invited me up. Thank you. Um, I actually joined because uh, Jennifer uh, 
she told me about this room actually phenomenal so we would like to hear from you yeah <laughs> jennifer said that there will be a friend joining and then i figured it must be you kelly so how do you say quick intro and what have you learned um... yeah quick quick intro um some of the founding general partner of inclusive ventures um one of our main focus is invest more in female and immigrants and people of colors as well as working with I guess underestimated LPs as well um, because there are a lot of LPs that could probably be more active in their investment decision making and our focus is more on the impact side. Um, Jennifer has been really gracious and introduced a lot of LPs to me internationally. Uh, so I'm actually quite new with the with getting international lps um and i've been working more domestically in the us i'm located in miami with my two partners in the bay area and la uh, so i'm here to learn from you guys actually and just listen more uh, we're here to learn from each other that's always how it works gorgeous thank you so much kelly and welcome on stage um right now uh let me just quickly reset the room so ladies and gentlemen we are talking about um psychology of success today this is our topic and we have phenomenal panelists that have just introduced themselves we're gonna go into a five set chat here with a couple of questions and then we're going to also open this stage for your questions where you can raise a hand come up on stage share and of course ask your uh, questions i would like to remind all of you guys to definitely follow all these phenomenal ladies on stage follow them on clubhouse with a bell because only if you click the bell button you will be actually notified when they speak on stage or when they uh, host their own rooms okay let's jump uh, straight into our fireside chat i think olivia it's uh, your question time yeah and actually <laughs> you had a great point about how um clubhouse is a great excuse to bring people together and i just wanted to say that I have followed Jen for so long and I finally got the excuse to reach out to her and bring her into a clubhouse room. So that is something hey awesome girl. about clubhouse. <laughs> um, so yeah, Ashley and I were talking about, you know, what kind of questions we wanted to ask and what we wanted to talk about on this topic. Um, and one of the things that comes up often um, is are you, do you have to have certain qualities or skills to make you a successful entrepreneur? Um, and are those qualities inherent? Like, do you have them naturally or are they built up over time? So curious to know from the moderators and panelists that we have right now, what your opinion is and what your experience is about this. I'll dive in. <laughs> Uh, one of the most important things that I learned was how to hire people. And I would say that it was, some of it was innate. Some of it is a natural assessment. Um, but I also made a lot of mistakes when I first started hiring in China. And there was a book that actually completely changed my perspective. I used to worry about culture and fit and, you know, the personality of the person on top of what was on their resume, like what the the written skills were. But um, after reading this book called Who, the, the A Method for Hiring, it completely changed how I did my interviews, the questions that I asked, and the approach to, to just hiring the right managers was a, a complete 180. And I can dive into that um, on this call, on this, on this conversation. But um, for me, my, my biggest recommendation is, is reading Who. Um, it completely changed how I recruit. Kim, you have a great podcast with Elijah Whaley on this, um, talking about this that I listened to the other week. That was fantastic. So I would recommend people to check that one out. Yeah, maybe I'll follow on from Kim. I, I probably have, um, I was reflecting on this, that there's probably like a laundry list. So maybe we can go through them uh, throughout the conversation. But the first one that kind of jumps out to me is actually self-awareness. And it might seem irrelevant at first thought. And, and at least when I started my business, I think I was, um, this was probably my lowest capability, <laughs> if you will. And what I mean by that is the ability to know what you're good at, know what you're not good at, and then being able to, whether that's hire for, upskill for, bring on advisors and coaches. But then also having that uh, humility to learn to ask for help because you have the self-awareness of where your gaps may be, um, to be able to listen, 
to those who have opinions different to yours and be able to respond um, in a way that exerts leadership that ultimately inspires people to want to work even harder or, or, or think about a problem even more. Um, I attribute a lot of that back to the self-awareness component. And it's almost, at least from my experience starting a company, was having a mirror where every day it reflects back to you all of your best and worst qualities and you're supposed to be highly functional and high performing in delivering some value to the world, which is um, no easy task. <laughs> Stemming up with Jen's point in terms of being vulnerable, um, when you're, you're leading a team, it's your startup, you feel like you have no room for error, no room for mistakes. And so one of the most important lessons I learned was to find those coaches and mentors that I could count on to to be vulnerable with and to bounce off those ideas and kind of work your way out of like, you know, those low points. Because the entrepreneurial journey is incredibly, incredibly taxing and um, it's hard to find. It's definitely hard. And so I work, I don't know, Jen, if you have any advice on how to find those people. But um, for me, it's a lot of trial and error along the way. Absolutely. And on that, I would also like to add that having a community, having the mentors, having the community, I have a mastermind group of actually women um, that are also in business. And I've got another mastermind of, you know, professional speakers um, in the same kind of area. We come together, we talk about our issues, we talk about our wins and just having that support network because entrepreneurship, as, as Kim said, is such a um, very often a lonely journey and uh, definitely learning to be vulnerable, right? So it's the right balance. For me, what was really, really important to understand is that everything starts with the psychology of the founder. So if you have bad psychology, if you have doubt, if you have a lot of fear, if you have a lot of negativity, if you're a pessimist, um, if you don't see, um, you know, solutions, but only problems and obstacles, that's going to define your startup, your company, your business, your growth. The business that you're running is never going to outperform the psychology of its founder. And that stuck with me. I learned it uh, maybe four or five years ago. And that was really the most important kind of uh, slogan and tagline by which I started building that business and developing it truly and investing in my own psychology. And then, of course, you know, passing it on to everybody on the team. Um, I think we're going to talk about specific tips and routines later, but that was really, really big. And another thing was really starting to share your journey. I think as, as an entrepreneur, uh, as a leader in 2021, doesn't matter whether we run our own firm or we you know, work for someone, but we need to share the journey. We need to share our voice. We need to share uh, what we know with the industry and build our own community and that is very very uncomfortable i know it was very uncomfortable for me start recording myself on videos and you know start publishing on linkedin or twitter or instagram or wherever else it was very very uncomfortable but then you do it before you're no longer afraid before you're no longer you know editing yourself too much and uh, that is extremely powerful in 2021 because that community essentially pushes you forward and you learn all the time and you essentially also get uh, incredible business results yeah, Ashley, kind of riding off of that, you know, you know the, the the notion of like founder market fit, right? So much of it is, um, hey, does this founder have a proven past experience in this field? Therefore, they're the most best position to innovate within it. I think even one layer deeper than that, and, and I don't know if there's a way where VCs can take a more active assessment or, or maybe just provide more coaching, it would be that, you know, is, is this individual founder and the founding team, them as people in the best um, support system, in the best phase in their lives to embark on this world's hardest job. And a lot of that does come down to your psychology and your awareness of where your gaps and strengths are. And I almost wish that when I started my business that, you know, my seed investors, rather than um, us having conversations about go to market and how you grow. We almost just have one layer of conversation pre-signing any edge to shareholders agreement to actually just self-examine on, you know, the mindset of whether or not the founders are at the best. Um, similarly, I think sponsors probably wouldn't back athletes going to the Olympic Games if they didn't pass certain thresholds to prove that they have the mental and physical acumen to do so. 
And the same should be for, for entrepreneur and ultimately set the founders up for success too. Yeah. So to that note, I, I do think that it's actually both. Like some are born, some entrepreneurs are born, and you just have that mindset already. Um, you're more of an optimist and you're more gritty and you're more um, adaptive. Um, I, I read a study that um, looking at all the pro uh, profiles and and all the metrics actually uh, it's not the background of the founder a lot of the times actually it's how how the team would be willing to pivot based on the market and those actually uh, those are the startups that actually would do well to the end um, so i i do think all the things that you i agree with all the things that you guys said about uh having having to have a coach because i think it's all all the mindset game right it's it's I think in the future of work as well, um, of course you want to share, of course you want to share what you know already because the market is changing every day. So you're going to share what you've done already and then the next year or the next month is going to change. So I think the key thing really to be an entrepreneur in this day and age is to be able to ex to have the courage to experiment. And, and when you fall, you come back up again and i'm sure jen would <laughs> she speak to this a lot so which jen oh me <laughs> oh yes you just yes. came in so yes i just came in um uh, i i heard the grit and then i actually um thought of actually some some things um because uh kelly's fund is um their, their, their focus is on female immigrant and diverse and then there's a stereotype but i kind of think it's true um because uh my uh my ancestors, uh, or actually my grandparents, they were all orphaned in World War II. And I think it was pure survival that, uh, and sort of those survival instincts that powered them through to, you know, rebuild their lives in Hong Kong. And then my parents were immigrants to the U.S. who met in college. And, you know, growing up, I thought it was very normal for them, for people to be working three full-time jobs. Like my mom, I think she was sleeping three or four hours a night. She would sleep in my piano lessons while like, you know, listening to me. Um, I mean, I, I always thought that was a normal thing, which was one of the reasons why I became a workaholic now, later in my life. And um, one of the things that I always asked her and then asked my um, grandfather before he died was like, what, what made you guys like just keep, you know, persevering? And he was like, well, it's about survival. It's about like, which, you know, which of my brothers or sisters would have enough rice to eat. It would, it would literally come down to that. So I feel like grit and survival and all that is like really ingrained in us by sometimes the historical experience of our ancestors. And um, and, and even now, like my, my grandma, she has uh, Alzheimer's, but before she went into the care home, she would have nightmares and flashbacks to that. And then like um, uh, to the point where we, we actually opened her mattress once and found like it was completely stuffed with cash from the wartime. So um, I think that kind of carries uh, carries through with that grit. So maybe building off of that, like if we were to assume nature, and I know Ashley you had that as that, I think one of the topics, nature versus nurture, like are, are these earned skills or, or, or um, uh, naturally born with? If we assume that nature equals it's within your DNA and all of your experiences, upbringing, how your parents um, raise you are then in nurture. I I do agree with Jennifer that probably more than not that those are nurture induced qualities. But actually, as someone who uh, I'm a proud person who've gone through therapy, I I feel like one of the 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 aspects that I took away from that experience is that you can always rewire and reparent yourself. Therefore even if you've been nurtured to have certain qualities or not to have certain qualities, um, the, the choice and the responsibility is still very much in your ownership to reparent yourself and then learn um, these skills, whether that be you know, humility or grit, um, that then may serve you better uh, to be an entrepreneur. So um, I do believe it's nurture, but then nurture also means that therefore you can relearn essentially. Yeah, our, our, our genome can be changed based on based on our environment. So definitely greater on the nurture and then nature kind of give you that leg up, right? 
Yeah, and this is probably our biggest uh, mission in life to figure out what can I become, right? Each of us individually. We're given certain nature, certain nurture. We're born into a certain culture with uh, a set of circumstances. And then for each of us, we keep answering that question. What can I become year after year? And I believe that this is a beautiful journey. And indeed, it is a combination of both. I kind of want to ask... Yeah, yeah, I want to have a question. <laughs> I was going to ask you, Kim. <laughs> You're going to ask me? Okay, yeah. fine, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, putting you on the spot. Um, or, or I guess even for Jennifer, like for both of you who, you know, are moms and building your families and having gone through this like chapter of building your own businesses, do you look to what skill sets to pass on differently, either to compensate or to strengthen them to be more entrepreneurial or, or otherwise? So I know we oh. talked about optimism um, earlier today, and I, I I think along with grit is optimism is essential characteristic to be an entrepreneur. And so my question to the room was, is optimism something you can choose? Like, has any, has anyone ever met a pessimistic success, a pessimistic entrepreneur that's successful? Right. So um, it's interesting because I gave a course on this with delivering happiness. Um, it's called learn optimism. Um, optimism, mm -hmm. it's something that you learn, uh, really. Um, it's really to be able to see the opportunities when something happened with that lens. Um, yeah, it's, it's, if you are optimistic, you're able to achieve so much more and in, in life. And there's actually loads and loads of study in positive psychology. And I, I've heard that you guys actually gone through some positive, positive, positive psychology courses. So I'm sure you guys know about this. So I've never taken a positive psychology course, but when I was a teenager, so probably around 12 or 13 years old, I was reading one of those silly teen magazines. It was probably like Cosmopolitan Teen. And they used to always have these, um, these personality quizzes. You know, like, are you an optimist, for example? That was like something like that. And I remember after taking one of these quizzes, I could sort of reconstruct the whole thing and figure out how to get the answer that I wanted based on the multiple choice. And from that point on, I realized that me taking a personality quiz does not dictate who I am for the rest of my life for that moment in time. But I can break it down and decide right then and there that I'm going to be a positive person or a happy person, et cetera. And so I think for me, I think that moves like mental, um, mental model, shifting from being a person who doubted myself or always questioned to deciding, you know what, in order to win, you have to be in it. In order to, to be in it, you have to believe in yourself. And I think that is conscious. And it is true if you were raised in um, a setting where everyone questioned you and your capabilities, it's very hard to break out of that. Um, I think for better or worse, my parents were probably pretty open-minded and not overly positive, but at least encouraging. And I think that helps set the framework too. So when I look at how I raise my kids, I have three, um, I find them some on the spectrum of more likely to question themselves and be more nervous, anxious, or even pessimistic. And I think as a parent, and not only as a manager, but also as a parent, I see that something that can be coached and trained over time. Yeah, and I, I just want to, uh, Jen, to your point about um, how, like, um, I, I think my, my parents were decidedly a little bit more tiger parents and on my case than Kim's were from what, um, and I also predicate this with, uh, Kim and I have known each other for like a decade. Um, uh, we were you know, our, our, our oldest children are within uh, several months of each other and, and everything. So um, I, I would always like, uh, I don't like to compare experiences, but I, I realized that when I was growing up and then like sometimes Kim will tell me like, hey, you know, take it easy. And she's been my friend in times like that where she's like, and she's been my, almost like my inner voice where I realized like I've habituated into, um, you know, I realized the voice because I've actually gone through therapy too. And I, I really believe in, in therapy, but I realized my inner voice sometimes is my father's voice um, criticizing me um, because one of the reasons why I decided to go to, I chose my undergrad university 
And one of the reasons why I decided to go to business school is because my father always told me, you have to have a plan A, B, or C. And the reason is because um, I was I was a piano competition winner. And then one of the times at a competition, I my, my aunt slammed my finger in the car door without realizing it. And I was like, I was crying. I think I was like nine or 10 years old. And then they put a popsicle stick splint on my finger so that I could play through the competition. My finger was actually slightly bleeding on the key, but I finished the piece. And I think I was like, you know, crying backstage. And then later on, they announced the awards and said that I came in second. And then instead of being happy for me, my father um, came over and said, um, do you know what? You really need to apply to real schools later and focus on your studies because uh, you might, uh, if, you, if you're relying on your piano, you might come in second. Do you want to come in second your whole life? And it made me feel like really bad. So now I make sure that when I, uh, like, I mean, over time, I think, he, you know, he definitely mellowed out. But like now with my own kids, the only thing that I really want them to come away with is um, to be really creative and innovative. And if not optimistic, then have that sense of wonderment and curiosity and um, inquiry. Um, basically, right now, during the pandemic, it's been very hard, you know, with the Zoom schooling, the hybrid schooling, everything. So one thing I try to do with them um, is that I try to take them on weekly hikes. They're not really outdoorsy, which is kind of sad, but um, I actually um, write little notes from like fictional characters for them that they've been reading. And then I leave little gifts as well as like a uh, little like treats. And then they, instead of like, you know, trick or treating, they'll pick them up on the trail and be like, wow, you know, the tooth fairy left me this, you know, toothbrush and a letter. And then, and so uh, I, I want them to feel like anything is possible, but possible. And that's one of the ways I get them to do that. The other thing I do is I gamify, um, the, their to-do list or their obligations for the day. So basically, if my daughter practices piano, then I say like, okay, you know, I pay you twenty dollars monopoly money, or she makes her own money, and then they redeem it for treats. So the treats might be like, you know, adventure, you know, turn the living room into escape room, like things like that. So I have things for them to redeem, so that they realize the value of money and are not materialistic and use it to purchase experiences rather. And then the final thing I do is that. I um, had my kids make a lot of um, face shields, um, PPE, like I put them to work, like a modern lemonade stand so that they would, um, uh, you know, make that. And then I sold them to like friends like him and other friends I knew um, for quite expensive, a pop. And then we donated about 60,000 to um, charity. So I had to make 200 face shields. And that, that way it was kind of like they had an experience setting up a, um, a, a social enterprise and then donating to charity. So that's what I did with my kids here in the Um, I just want to add quickly, thank you for sharing, Jennifer, um, yeah, all those good tips for parenting, because I have two kids on my own too. But I just want to share real quick about um, the book that I mentioned, it's by Martin Seligman. He was actually um, depressed, clinically depressed, and he, and now he's an authoritative figure in the positive of psychology. Sorry, the positive psychology. Um, so if you look him up, um, the book is called Learn Optimism. And there is sections in there for how you can be more optimistic to at work as well as as a parent and, and all of that. And there's exercise in there that you can use. Just want to share that. Thank you so much, Kelly and Jennifer. Um, we've been talking a lot about mindset, but I want to go back to something that Jen actually said at the beginning. I think she really hit the nail on the, on the head when she said that you need to be self-aware. And from listening to all these amazing stories that you guys have, there's really at the core of it, um, I keep coming back to this self-awareness. You know, you have to have the self-awareness to choose optimism. You have to have the self-awareness to recognize when you are struggling. You have to have the self-awareness to be able to ask for help. Um, so I, I think so much of it comes down to this self-awareness. Um, but once you have this self-awareness, and you know, Jennifer, you were talking a lot about what you were doing for your kids to kind of build these habits, um, and they don't even know that they're building these habits yet. Um, but as an adult, how have you ladies built your own habits or how have you consciously um, started to change your behavior to make yourself more successful or to give yourself more energy or to be able to build a better team? What are some of the things that you have been able to consistently put into your routine and that have helped you?
Um, I guess I'll share first. <laughs> um, I think time blocking definitely helps me. Um, time blocking with I love time blocking. even <laughs> yes, even with tasks that's like not with other people. I think the key thing is we think we have meeting and then we're gonna get those things done when we just assign to do list to ourselves. But then you we forget sometimes to schedule time to actually do those things and then we just keep piling them on. And I think as regarding to habit, there is this anatomy of habits. I think if you, I, I think there's a, I forgot the, it's called a, uh, I forgot the name of it. It's some sort, it's, I think if you're in advertising, you probably know uh, the loop. Pretty much it's that you would kind of like thinking about Facebook, right? Or any type of social media, you get a trigger and then you do do though, and then every time you have that trigger, and then you do those things. After you do those things, then supposedly you would get some sort of reward. But that reward, a lot of the time, I'm talking about bad habit. A lot of the time doesn't really give you the actual results. And then you, and then that same trigger happens. You just kind of go into a loop, and that happens with bad and good or good habit. So I think. Uh, I, I learned about this because I was actually also part is part of the another course I was creating. Um, but yeah, so if you want to build habit, it's also in a, I guess, broader sense of way you could actually build that into your daily routine. Like what, what is it that like that could trigger you to do certain things? And then you think about what would be good when you, when that trigger happened. Right. Um, Absolutely. And fun. Kelly, maybe, <laughs> you're, maybe you're talking about this book, which is called The Power of Habit uh, by Charles Duhigg. And he's exactly explaining this loop of building a habit and essentially building your life around habits, uh, which is a great book to check out. Um, to, yeah, to share some of my uh, uh, habits, I would say for me, the big change came when I stopped watching news. So right now, I'm literally not watching any negative news. I'm not watching BBC, CNN, whatever else is there. I'm not reading them. Um, I do get my news from the sources. For example, Economist once a week, for me personally, is okay. And then also industry news, you know, from the industry where I'm in. So I have people that essentially deliver relevant insights uh, to my phone, email, or whatever. So that was a big, big change. The same thing happens with people. So if you have negative people around you, the ones that are always bragging, always pointing to what's not going to work, etc., etc. If you work with some toxic people, if they are part of the family, if they are in your friend circle, you really need to make a decision and that decision essentially needs to be whether you protect yourself so are you going to support and protect your mindset and your uh, psychological well-being or are you going to entertain this relationship um the second one is i believe that um you know when you want to be energetic so essentially energy when you have this energy when you have this presence uh you become the most um not powerful person in the room, but the most noticeable person in the room and your energy is contagious. So essentially in business and leadership, we need to have that energy. We need to have that presence. And in order to uh, start it, it doesn't come from outside. It comes from within. So in order to initiate it, we need physical movement. So in the morning, no matter what, no matter whether it's winter or summer, whether I'm traveling, well, prior to COVID-19 or staying at home, I wake up in the morning, I play powerful, powerful music, something like MC Hammer or Cool in the gang and uh, shake that ass for three four minutes and that brings a lot a lot of power you can jump you can clap your hands that brings a lot of energy and you are charged for the whole day before important meetings i go to the bathroom i shake that ass and uh whenever i, I need that, to be actually. yeah just that just shake that ass um and the final one uh, just uh, just what you guys said uh, you need to yeah make time to think so i actually in my calendar i have this meeting like three hour blocks uh, called meeting with myself and sometimes it's just me you know chilling or thinking about something or uh, going and doing massage but essentially every day there's a block of time which is a meeting with myself and you virtually schedule this 
me time taking care of me massage you know your uh, your uh, i don't know acting right now i have this acting instructor that comes and she teaches me drama uh, or yoga instructor comes etc and you pay the money up front and you block your calendar and you just make sure that there's no excuse to cancel it so these are my three habits that are incorporated in every single day i love your hacks ashley i have to um um uh, kind of interject about um Okay, so um, those of you who are my friends, um, I, I, know, I know Kim and Vivian and um, uh, Kelly also know what happened to me. But um, basically, with my um, with my first child, um, she came preterm, but she she was fine. Um, she was five weeks early. With my son, he was he was um, I was actually in labor at thirty three weeks and a few days without knowing it. I was in what you would call, would call silent labor because I was actually like such a workaholic by then that I was shutting down. My body was shutting down and I didn't realize it. And I was in, I was like, I was actually, oh my gosh, like basically my oxygen was dropping. I was having asthma attacks. And I broke my water without knowing it. Um, and then when I went to the hospital, they were trying to stabilize my breathing. They were trying to make sure I was okay. And at that point I was in the middle of a very stressful, like m a with one of my companies. And I had like, completely ignored all signs that like I was either in pain or in labor or anything. So they were making sure the baby was okay and everything one side. But then when the shift, the, when the next nurses came to on, on the shift, some of them didn't realize my water had broken or that I was in active labor. And I also didn't realize it. My husband was with me in the hospital and he actually left in the morning and it turned out I was in labor for like another half a day. And then finally, so there were people who came over from maternity to check on me. And then they they actually called the doctor. They were like, oh, my gosh, she can code. Because um, my oxygen uh, not only had dropped, but at my at my contractions were 10 seconds apart. Um, so by the time the doctor got there, he was like, we have to operate immediately. We're going to put you under. Like, it's just, it was insane. And I didn't know whether the baby would um, be okay. Um, and I, they were giving him, um, they were giving me, um, injections, steroid injections for the baby's lungs, but it turned out to like help me too. And I was in the ICU for two weeks after having my son. I almost died. Um, and then when I came back to life, basically, um, it was a really sort of like hard recovery for me. And one of the ways I did that was actually through um, through yoga. And then uh, the same thing actually happened, but I was able to carry my um, last child last year uh, fully to term. So made it to 37 weeks with her. And then um, I was actually on the asthma medication again. So some similar things were happening, but not to that extent because I was taking better care of myself. And then when the pandemic happened, I actually started doing yoga as well as practicing the piano every day. Um, and and the yoga, I got quite advanced. I could do full splits now on one side. I can do headstand, handstand. I was never able to do any of this stuff before. But the one reason why I try to practice yoga frequently is because if I don't do it, I forget to breathe. And it's now because I've been practicing yoga so religiously that I am now off of all my asthma medication now for two years. Jen, so that's thanks for care. sharing such an intense personal um, sharing. I know... Um, there's, you know, I know the overall topic of the, the room is, you know, psychology of success and entrepreneurship. And I wanted to um, build off of what Ashley was saying about scheduling that me time, which I don't do, and I'm going to start doing tomorrow. Um, I always schedule uh, tasks and things I need to do with people, things I don't want to do. I schedule with people on my team and that forces me to do it. So are you saying all of our lunches are because you don't no, want to do them? No, 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 no. <laughs> actually, actually, um, one of the biggest lessons I learned, um, was to say, no, there was definitely in the early years of being, uh, an entrepreneur, I felt this need to connect with whoever wanted to connect with. And I was always getting coffees and I found myself like, just just not really sure what I was getting out of everything. And so actually now, if I'm getting lunch with someone, I'm sorry, it is it's very conscious and very deliberate. And it's for it's it's not just because I have no ability to say no, it's because I want to. So that that's take that as the highest compliment. Good so, tonight, good tonight. I'm gonna <laughs> sleep well tonight, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here today in Clubhouse because I consciously want to um be able to connect with others and share insights and however I can and, and be curious and ask questions and learn from you all. So thanks all. I, I know it's been almost an hour, so I wanted to sort of reset the room and 
uh, let uh, let the expert moderators kind of guide through the Q and A. Thank Thanks, you so Kim. much, Kim. This is awesome, um, uh, guys. Let me remind you once again. So this room, we are talking about. Um, psychology of success, uh, leadership and entrepreneurship. I would like to once again invite all of us in the audience to follow the phenomenal panelists on um, on top. Um, all of them are phenomenal women in business, in leadership, and make sure that you follow them with a bell because you're going to be notified next time they're hosting or speaking in the room. And I'd also, now, like, to, I'd also like to really thank, I uh, see Chris has moved, Chris is the founder of Tech Talks and he's moved himself back to the audience. Um, he and I share the same last name. I really feel like he's my brother in many ways, but um, he uh, he very kindly let us host uh, our, our room in Tech Talks today. And uh, I'm really, really grateful so also, also, you know, in addition to following all of us, which you must, because otherwise, you know, you can't be on Clubhouse if you don't follow us. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, you should follow Tech Talks as well, because we, um, we'll be hosting uh, different events here. And hopefully, uh, you know, we can have our um, our next uh, room here again um, soon, um, because uh, I, I'm really enjoying myself. It's like it's like it's like a structured girl time, you know, in front of hundreds of people. Not a big deal. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. Absolutely. Let's uh, all follow te uh, Tech Talks. I'm actually going to be following them right now. Uh, let me ask the last question to the panel. Meanwhile, uh, guys in the audience, uh, this is your time. We're going to start taking questions soon. So if you would like to jump on stage and ask, ask a question, uh, share your story, your take, raise your hand. We're going to be bringing people uh, uh, in a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, here is my question. What are some of the mindsets that actually you struggle or struggled with and how have you overcome them? Um, what are some of the mindsets maybe you would like to share with us that you are trying to uh, remedy and change currently? So anybody on the panel who wants to go first? This is the juicy bit that I sign up for. <laughs> Jokes. Um, I think it's, it's talking about what doesn't work and the failures. Um, we can all um, learn so much from it, right? Um, I think one of the feedbacks that I've received when, when I was running my company was that I didn't have the ability to switch between two speeds. And almost when, when, when this concept was brought to me, like I didn't, like, I just didn't even understand. <laughs> what do you mean there's two speeds? Um, and I think that, uh, that, that two speeds sort of showed up in, in a few different areas. It was, um, how I spent my time, um, genuinely, you know, grinding as long hours as I could per day without being able to dial back seven days a week. I think it's in the ability to communicate with others. I had somehow thought maybe it's it's from my upbringing, from schooling, that perhaps a more um, dominant and an aggressive way of communicating, whether it was with my investors or uh, folks on my team, was the most effective way or efficient, rather, uh, to get things done. I think lack of um, being able to see that the two speed is also around, you know, even how you grow your business. It's not uh, charging and, 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 and paid acquisition every single day, let's say, to, to, to get after a particular metric. And so after I've been given that feedback, I think it was then really looking at, well, how do you how do you know how to dial on and off? And I think that's the magic power because the and, and it closely ties into the notion of self-awareness, which we've been speaking about. If you can exercise when you go and when you don't and when you go fast, when you go slow, um, I think that ability um, really just, you know, supercharges your team also and, and ultimately gives everybody more energy in the tank. And maybe one way in how I sort of, it, at least it works for me is, I think in talking about uh, habits just now, it's often easy to also, you know, list out a, a, a list of things and, you know, read uh, a 5, a 5 a.m. club and, and follow all of those coaching. But what are habits really for? And I think what it came down for me was that habits were a very structured way of living. And then when you're structured and you're disciplined, you minimize the possibility for um, spontaneity or for accidents. And, and I think it's in uh, these spontane uh, spontaneous occurrences that then you are more likely to be reactive, whereas in structure and in discipline, because it's expected kind of cadence of, of how your day goes, um, you have more space to then 
dial this to speed in order to respond. So that's kind of how these few things around habits, around um, what I struggled with, and ultimately the kind of mindset um, that, in my opinion, would uh, set up a founder up for success. Jen, you said that beautifully and almost forgot if I had written that down when I sent these questions to you, because my answer was my the mindset that I struggle with is almost exactly that, the very delicate balance between efficiency and effectiveness, um, you know, wanting to move fast and wanting to get the most done, but wanting to get it done right, I think is like walking a tight walk almost every single day. One of the other kind of mindsets I think that I struggle with a lot and that I hear a lot of female, you know, not only entrepreneurs, but executives um, and females in corporate is um, comparing yourself. So creating your own benchmarks, you know, not looking at other entrepreneurs or looking at other people in business and, um, you know, comparing yourself to their progress. Um, it sounds cliche, but you you make your own milestones. Um, and it is certainly a, a hard mindset to pull away from, um, but something that I've been working pretty hard at this year. I actually just wanted to quickly do um, a time check. It turns out that um, our discussions and everything have been so inspiring that um, uh, Chris and uh, uh, Tech Talks have allowed us to um, have an extension on our original time. So well done, you guys. Um, we uh, will be having the room for another um, half hour to an hour. Let's see how the flow goes. But yeah, relax, enjoy it. I have a call to jump out on, but I'll be back along with Chris to um, um, close the room down properly later too. And I love doing it my own way. I'll be sending you out with some music. So um Anyway, um, please, please carry on. Um, I'll be back in and out. Um, I'm loving this. I, I want to have like, you know, power hour with you guys like all the time now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jennifer. Looking forward to a uh, chat soon. Enjoy a call. And we are back. Uh, so, um, yeah, Olivia, you were just saying that, uh, you know, looking looking at others and essentially measuring your success by your own yardstick, this is very, very important. I think I've also struggled uh, with that for a while. Um, and I mean, it, it's still it's still difficult because I've actually, um, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago, um, I suddenly had all these amazing people. Basically, when I started learning psychology, right, I went on this. I'm not sure what you guys no, but there's uh, Tony Robbins, uh, who is like a big psychology dude and many, many other programs. So I've also basically traveled the world, joined many of his programs around the world in Australia, in the US, here and there. And then I met so many cool people in business. And then essentially, you know, the whole circle expanded. And then I saw people like 23 years old. You know, I was usually the youngest, you know, person, the hustler in the room. And suddenly somebody who is 23 and by um, normal means much more successful than I am, you know, with all these attributes. And then I felt, oh my God, am I such a failure? Um, you know, in a different location, doing all these different things when somebody else is so much more successful. Met so many also phenomenal bloggers. I know Kim works with bloggers in China very often and very, very often they're extremely young and they're just so cool and so successful. And it, it, it takes a while to, first of all, understand that everybody is definitely going through their own journey. Secondly, that nothing is as simple and easy as it seems from afar. And uh, yeah, so this is definitely something that I've worked on as well. And um, it is a journey and it has uh, it has definitely improved. Yeah, to build on, on what Ashley and Olivia talk about looking at others. So I work in public markets. So a lot of times you are your portfolio is ranked against others so you're forced to look at others so it's quite difficult and sometimes because the stocks your portfolio even is like built perfectly it's not going up every day but so some sectors might go up but yours are not going up so it's very important to have patience and not have the not have the formal actually so sometimes if you look at the other portfolio they are going up and then you chase the hot stocks and then you won't end up well so that's my sharing 
super, super awesome. Um, anybody else wants to share their struggles currently or shall we move to questions? I know, so is it Samata has been on stage and she had raised her hand and wanted to ask a question. So Samata, you, would you like to introduce yourself and um, cue the panel? Thank you. I felt like a bit of an oddball on stage with you phenomenal speakers knowing I'm kind of asking you questions from the audience. So thank you for, for, um, for letting me speak. My name is Samata. I'm the CEO of Red Carpet Green Dress. We're a sustainable design initiative founded by Susie Amos Cameron and James Cameron, who are huge environmentalists. Um, James obviously is known for his work with Avatar, but he's a deep world explorer, passionate about the environment, and Susie is a leader in sustainable education. So through my work, we work with um, partners like Tesla and Les Lensing. So I'm just super passionate about sustainability. Um, as an introduction to myself, it's been so energizing listening to you women. I have to say, I am so grateful for this room because as a CEO, I kind of, my energy kind of propels me forward. So hearing you all speak from your relative positions is very energizing for me. So thank you. Um, and my question was about um, metrics, actually, because with sustainability right now, people are starting to acknowledge that the, the typical kind of traditional metrics like carbon footprint and energy consumption or water footprint, yes, they're great, they're important. But finally, there's a recognition that the human element of sustainability is just as important. So things like your, you know, charity donation rate or your participation in social initiatives or your kind of social security rate, things like that. And the care economy is equally as important as just environmental initiatives. I just wondered if sustainability is an area of interest for any of you, um, and if so, kind of what metrics or what areas are you really excited about right now? Uh, thank you for letting me speak. So um, I'm actually invested in a, I guess it's called, um, what's it called, uh, upcycling um, platform in Asia called Retycle, which is primarily focused on, on children's clothing. And so this is one of the really exciting um, startups that I've been involved in that is bringing a, a that, that has sustainability at its core, um, which is relatively compared in Asia, specifically in um, whether it's China or the you know, the broader Asia Pacific region. Sustainability is still relatively new. It hasn't been um, as on top of mind as, as it is compared to the US and European market. So we definitely see it um, ticking up both in terms of the direct to consumer brands as well as um, we have investors, VCs who are specifically focused um, in the space. And so I don't know if I can really share any particular metrics when, when looking at um, companies in the space, but in particular, it's always about the community. Right. I, so, so what what exactly how is how are the people and the companies involved? How are they actually growing that community? Because a lot of it is to come down to education um, and what that means. And so I, I definitely think from the perspective of seeing what's happening in the US market versus in Asia, this is very much um, on an uptick, but it will take some time. There have been a lot of brands who have built around whether it's like um, all birds or uh, there are some major, um, what I consider Western or global brands when they come into markets like Asia, where how they would measure their success, you know, like whether it's their brand equity or even just at the sales level, not as, not as much of it as, as driven by that sustainability message as one would expect. Um, so the consumer very much is in a, uh, in a, in a growing mindset when it comes to this area. And maybe Jen, I don't know if you can elaborate more on this, but that's kind of what I've seen from my perspective. Thank you. Yeah. So much of what an important question. I think as someone who um, spent quite a lot of time in consumer uh, tech, whether that's at the retail side or VC side, actually, I, I constantly ask myself this like existential question, does any of this matter? You know, ultimately, it's uh, investing more money so then uh, uh, folks can spend their hard-earned cash to buy more stuff and the stuff that's produced are likely not sustainable not mindful materials uh, that, that your team is working on so uh, i do I, th I think this question has been extra uh made extra relevant especially after reading uh bill gates uh, new book that just came out in the last two weeks and i think the concept around uh carbon offset versus carbon removal i think to my ignorance even even someone who's been in the retail sector if you will i just haven't really given much thought 
um, and and sure we can you know superficially go and offset um, our CO two emissions, especially pre COVID, flying around a lot. But I, I think in my conscience, I just wrote that off as like, oh well, at least I did something. But recently, seeing you know even United Airlines making a really bold commitment to completely remove CO two, um, and when that CO two is completely extracted from the atmosphere. It just changes the game with, with 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 the air particles that are left behind. So, uh, personally, I'm really excited about that, um, and at least you know just being more open minded to learning more. Thank you, thank you so much, Jen. This is awesome. Thank you so much, Samantha, for your question. Let's move on to the next question. And guys, I would like to remind you, if you have a question or would like to come up on stage to share some to share some of your experiences, please raise your hand uh, right now, anytime. Um, in the next five to ten minutes. Uh, Yuan Fan, uh, you are with us on stage. Please unmute yourself and address your question. Hi. Yeah, hi. Thanks for unmuting uh, me. I'm still new to the community, so I uh, often forget to uh, mute myself uh, when I'm on the stage. So I currently live in the United States, and I've been living here for a long time. And I, I have one question. Actually, I have uh, it's a three-party question. Um, so the first one is about digital discrimination. Uh, for example, we have uh, like lateral access. How do we solve that problem? For example, in when people are um, people don't have uh, access to technology, uh, remote learning. You know, with the COVID, that brings up the issue of remote learning. And I just wanted to, you know, make sure that. Not make sure, but why don't you think the society is not going to leave the people who are already behind further behind because they don't have the technology, the platform to access the say uh, fast uh, fast internet, uh, etc. How do we do that? And also, I understand that China has moved into a sphere where everything is done mobily. You know, uh, if we have that, of course, the older generation is going to be kind of left behind and how comfortable are they using the technology and are there any tools to help them gear up um, towards that? Is there any sufficient uh, human, you know, human help on getting things done digitally? So that's the two part question for this part, which leads to um, the second part of my question, for example, um, on technology, although this is also, uh, education, um, education in, uh, related. So, how do we kind of? There are lots of tutoring services online. You know, I know that people do that. Uh, my relative, they use tutoring online. So, how do people vet these people and make sure the background is safe? Because I'm thinking about uh, building something. Uh, non-profit, not non-profit, just not to generate profit. I know this is super hard to do some non-profit organizations in China, but I'm just saying that, you know, the goal is not to uh, do non, uh, do generate profit. So is how do we, how do we make sure that this can be done, you know, vet the people who volunteers, for example, um, for helping people read? Because I recently... Yeah. Not recently, actually a year ago, uh, yep. read some statistics that the uh, children's literacy rate is going down in China. Now, right. the other question I have, I'm you, sorry. You, Yuan, Yuan, sorry, sorry, I need, I'll need to stop you here because the question usually needs to be a bit shorter so we can actually Oh, I see. Them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so yeah, much. That, that's okay. I thought I only get one chance. Okay, I appreciate it. Sorry. <laughs> we, sorry, we appreciate you should have read the rules. Okay. No worries at all. I'll take myself off the air. But I do have another question if you have time. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. So let us quickly comment on uh, on the you know China because it also has a bit of the entrepreneurship angle. But let us quickly comment in terms of China and education and digitalization. And um, actually, as many of you might have heard, China just last week, uh, President Xi has uh, once again announced and celebrated, in fact, the um, complete victory, as they call it, uh, over. Uh, poverty. So um, that was once again celebrated. And in fact, it was achieved last year. So right now, the next target for China, and we're talking about lower tier city China, is in fact, um, getting rid of digital illiteracy. 
okay? And digital illiteracy means that you essentially uh, do not have a mobile phone, do not know how to shop online, do not know how to sell online, etc. And uh, I believe that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, again, our uh, China five-year plan is going to come out this month in March. So we're going to understand more details of how soon is it going to happen. But from what we expect, it's going to take another three to five years to eradicate digital illiteracy, to get 450 million people. And this is the number of people in China that do not have um, uh, essentially access to Internet right now. So um, uh, probably to get those 450 million people online and equipped with the right skills. And in terms of um, education, China is in many, many areas leading the world when it comes to technology, when it comes to, for example, STEM education, building robots, coding. There are many schools, uh, there are many hardware uh, providers from MakeBlock, etc., etc. But that's a completely separate topic that uh, probably needs to go uh, deeper into education and, you know, future of the world. Today, we're talking about psychology of success, and we have a panel of phenomenal women uh, here uh, that build their businesses, many of them not one, but several businesses that have led their teams and um, yeah so let's stay a little bit more on topic um, and if anybody has a question about mindset about um, building a company expanding a team getting hold of your psychology for success please raise your hand and we're gonna bring you on stage meanwhile let me address our panel ladies kim jen olivia jennifer any of you have um, you know a topic or something that you would like to discuss amongst us meanwhile Otherwise, we will let our um, audience speak, but maybe some of you also have a question. Ashley, you told us a little bit about your morning routine, but I'm curious to know, Jen, Jennifer, and Kim, what does your morning routine look like? Are you guys dancing as well in the morning, or what are you doing <laughs> to get ready for the day? <laughs> so I'm... I'm um, I'm a very structured person, as I said, to, I think in order to like um, create more space to respond rather than to react. And so I think um, that structure for me boils down to like weekly goals that I have to hit. Um, one is a, a book a week. Um, I have to learn something new every week, whether that's speaking to someone new or doing a class or even hopping into a, a clubhouse room um, of a topic that I don't know, let's say. I am a stickler for needing my eight to nine hours sleep. Um, I'm pretty diligent on this. And, and some might say like, well, how do you get stuff done? I, I think in this exchange, it's because uh, and, and I have the privilege of not having a family yet, that therefore I have that space um, to really commit to that. And then uh, when I hit that sleep goal every night, I know I bring that much more clarity and energy and kindness to do the work the next day. Um, I love it. I, it's a sleep goal. Jen, I just, I just need to borrow <laughs> that. I'm writing that down literally, my sleep goal. <laughs> yep, I'm very, very, very diligent on it. Um, and I meditate and work out um, daily. But the working out bit, I think this was another kind of aha that I had a, f a few years ago. So my upbringing, I was always the nerd in class and never played sports, um, which I think if you if you, if you were my friends now, you probably, you probably would be quite surprised as I'm probably the ex extreme opposite. But part of that, I think beyond, you know, you're looking good and, and, and physical attributes and changes, to me going to work out, it's like going to the gym for my mind, because if I know that I can accomplish a new milestone or push myself to hit a new kind of a better version of myself by way of like lifts or distance run or time, that kind of sense of control of my own um, performance and knowing that I can put my mind into doing something and then achieving it, I think that energy is infectious to then bring to you know my work, my personal life. So. For me, the, the the working out daily is much more than uh, the physical component of it. But it, gen it, it genuinely, it's like going to the gym for my mind so that I can actually perform better with my mind outside of uh, fitness. Thanks, Jen. I have to admit, it took me decades to figure out that sleep goals were important. So for me, the challenge is making sure I go back to sleep, which is usually in about 10 minutes. So <laughs> I could have to check out soon. Um, <laughs> So I have three young kids, and so my mornings are spent trying to hack it so that they don't know I'm awake. So they, I, I'm actually literally hiding in the dark, 
they open the door, they see if I'm moving. <laughs> I, I consider it success if they shut the door and leave me alone. But um, for sure, um, the, the biggest challenge is how do I get to sleep on a regular time? And for me, it's having that sense of control on my coming day or coming weeks ahead. So usually I've already jotted down and time blocked what I'm going to accomplish over the next 24, 48 hours in my calendar. And then I can like easily wind down. I usually have to play certain music that kind of cues my brain that it's time to get off the devices, turn everything off and unplug. And that'll get me at least maybe six or seven hours is probably what I need at a minimum. But um, for sure, my morning routines used to be my most productive times. I'm a morning person. So once I had kids in the equation, I had to change my entire uh, focus of productivity because my mornings were no longer my me time to get things done before the day uh, dawns upon me. So it's it's definitely, um, I found that routines have had to like evolve um, every, you know, a few months to really fit with like the latest commitments. And for me, it's lately been Clubhouse. I really, really enjoy listening to Clubhouse. And so I make it a habit of walking um, so that I have time to actually listen to great conversations. This is super awesome. Thank you so much, Jen. Thanks, Kim. And we have three ladies joining us on stage here. We'll start with Xuanzi. Xuanzi, you are on. Please address your question and welcome on the panel. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for letting me in. Thanks for Thank everyone for creating the space. Actually, actually, you mentioned previously about Digital China, about next five year plan. So that really sparked me to really want to come on to stage and and to ask some of the panelists, like um, your opinion about um, China entrepreneur, female entrepreneurship, because I realized, okay, I was uh, attracted very much by the title of the room. So I popped in and um, I sort of captured the purpose here is to discuss about women empower women. And uh, just a little bit about me, because I have been working in the venture capital area in Europe in the past and the self was, um, serious entrepreneur has um, founded companies both in Berlin and Paris in the past five years so, and of course was a touch point with the China market and uh, recently I realized that um, you know as just me as a founder myself and as a female I can feel you know the, the you could, you could name it like gender discriminations or, uh, you know, just a sort of like um, untrust uh, or, uh, you know, sort of um, unfair, unspoken unfairness in the market by the male dominating industry. And so that leads to my question. Actually, I was very surprised by uh, some uh, recent report or phenomenon that a lot of uh, Chinese funders um, with uh, especially the new generation, I'm talking about uh, internet empowered uh, founders or female entrepreneurs that has um, appeared um, quite a lot um, within China. So actually, I'm very interested to know, like, what is your opinion about uh, the culture wise in China? From your perspective? Do you think uh, does uh, the tech ecosystem or the digital China has sort of uh, you know, uh, created a safer space for the female entrepreneurs to, to come to play on the stage. Um, and do you think uh, the women empower women phenomenon, uh, you know, is really uh, leapfrogging in, you know, the US or of course the Europe in, you know, in, in terms of supporting community among women? I'd like to hear your opinion about it. And please just share with me about some of them, uh, you know, the women uh, community that you have heard about in China. I'd love to thank you and contribute. I would say that from a fundraising perspective, I don't think it's any more challenging to get the meeting as a female versus a non-female entrepreneur in China. I, I think that um, investors are very receptive to that. However, you know, I, I, and there are pretty prominent and successful female VCs in China who who do back female founders. But I'll caveat with there's always that question mark of can you um, is this founder going to be committed enough for the nine nine six you know the JoJo Liu working 
um, nine to nine, six days a week, um, question mark. And I find with even with female VCs, they will uh, off the record question whether a female founder will commit to that should she come to a point in her life when she, say, decides to have a family. And so I, I, I can't say, we, I don't have the data to back it. I just know anecdotally in speaking with female, C, female VCs in China, this is, um, there is this sort of, uh, you know, cloud of doubt um, when it comes to funding. And that's just from my own personal experience. Totally agree. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to just build on what Kim has said. Um, indeed, China is uh, probably like the rest of the world. You know, it has its strong points. For example, when it comes to self-made billionaires, China is by far leading the world when it comes to female self-made billionaires. And in general, I come from the Soviet culture. I was born in the last years of Soviet Union. So we share a certain cultural, I would say, or ideological background with uh, China. And I would say that communism in general, uh, out of uh, daily necessity after the Second World War and due to its ideology, empowered women. So I grew up uh, watching very empowered um, movies where women were heads of you know businesses and they had their you know male accountants and you know they moved from small cities and suddenly took over moscow and became again heads or directors of big factories so all that stuff were the realities of my day um so i know a lot of women in china that are actually extremely successful and they do not when you ask them that, that is not even a topic like, oh, have you felt different because you're a woman? They say, no, I, I've never felt different. Uh, w- what is different about it? And at the same time, we cannot deny that, for example, when we go and look at tech community, uh, still three or four years ago, we had uh, those tech competitions for coders, right? Or some of the uh, tech companies where coding and gaming, like creating games was the big thing. So they would actually invite female cheerleaders in short skirts to dance for these guys to just keep their spirits up so obviously this is not a very empowered role so it is a country of contrast in many many ways like like everybody else right now and of course nobody cancelled out the fact as kim said if you're having a family so who is going to be the primary caretaker are you going to commit to nine and six do you have what it takes right now many tech founders are actually working um 10 10 7 Right. So basically the whole week without days off. And uh, I think in Asia, it's still we are very fortunate, not only in China, but many other parts of the world. There is generally an opportunity to, you know, submit your child to grandparents or hire an IE that is going to look after them. But that's also a choice. So in Asia, compared to Europe, where you are based, uh, the culture is different when it comes to, you know, the child being raised by, let's say, IE. So women have probably a bit more options. Plus, they have this ideological Power that is somehow supporting and helping them. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is my take on the topic. So I work with a lot of small to medium sized companies and about 80% of my, um, my clients are female founders, which is so amazing to me um, in China. And I think one of the, the interesting things as well, you know, you mentioned, does the digital um, capabilities in China foster um, you know, female founders and female-led businesses. And we find that um, in China, you know, a lot of people are running their business on these digital platforms like WeChat. And WeChat has this very unique capability to be able to build a community around a certain topic. Um, and women, I think, are amazing at building and growing and fostering communities. So China is a really, I think, unique space for this. And it's been amazing to see so many women build their businesses, you know, even just using one app, just using WeChat to build their community and then sell their products all in one space. Yeah, look, uh, kind of like landing that a little bit. I remember um, maybe six or eight months ago, um, there was an entrepreneur fundraising and her business was based on this social 
uh, commerce on WeChat where based on um, what she posted on Moments, her affiliate network of like subsequent kind of agents across like 100 plus cities would then be reselling uh, her photos. And she wasn't a KOL per se. She was just someone with a very highly engaged uh, WeChat group of friends. Um, she launched in six months and I think she did like three, four million uh, GMV, which, you know, I, I think in my opinion, if you could do that off your WeChat moments passively, posting some photos of apparel is pretty impressive, but that's definitely a unique opportunity and capability probably uh, for the women gender, especially on WeChat social commerce. Awesome stuff. Xuanzi, uh, I hope that we have um, answered your question. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I just um, may I have like a continued conversation with uh, you know um, Olivia, Kim, and Ashley and Jen because I think you have mentioned or very interesting perspective. I just want to, but I just don't want to take much more time of other speakers. That's why um, just make sure that um, I can still continue the conversation. Absolutely. So you can add us on WeChat. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Do connect with us. Uh, most of us have information about how to contact us and continue this conversation uh, in our bios and profiles. Thank you so much, Tuenza. Well, and right, meanwhile, you. and meanwhile, let's move on to Shirley. Shirley, you are next. How are you? Hi, thank you, Ashley. And lovely to see Kim and Jennifer here. Um, I, Shirley. if you allow me to take a, a, a moment to answer Shinzo's question. I was an investment banker for many years, and I took some of the uh, female listed uh, owned and um, companies to public. I have to say, the entrepreneurs in China, when it comes to a female, the the drive is just incredible. And uh, um, Jen mentioned about a lot of the WeChat uh, selling, a lot of what's going on in China in e-commerce space are powered by women and it's just phenomenal um i just have to say is it supportive uh, terra for the women entrepreneurs it's very much about economic power and when they they are much harder uh, as a, a working force and they're socially um, capable in a way of building a network so it the digital china is really powering this group of women who are so um, commercially savvy. And I have seen that among my investor friends who uh, back this under uh, female back to, um, entrepreneurs, um, Kathy Xu for um, Capital Today, um, some of the, even the, the male dominated VC space. But it is, it is actually very difficult to find a business that grew to be huge. Um, championed by women founders. And I'm always find that why is that? Um, so my question is, can women have it all being an entrepreneur? Because it's so demanding on their life. Um, you know, I, I know many of the moderators here have so many kids. Your, your ladies are super women. It's just amazing how beautiful you are, well kept, with running your household, running your business, running your investment. It, it is a lot of demands in our time, in our emotional well-being. Can we really manage it all? So I feel like I'll, this question is trending towards Kim. <laughs> uh, but then I'll, I'll take a quick stab. Um, I'm not, I, I'm probably more pragmatic by now, as you can tell. And I've kind of accepted that if there were three areas of my life that's uh in in that's that's thriving and moment in time then that's the best case scenario assuming that there's five facets of life um whether that's you know career your health um personal connections relationships um social contributions let's say i just accept that three of five would be my priority at any given moment in time but then that phase or that chapter may change um depending on you know different criteria of that quarter or of that year as it may. Oh, the age old question, can you have it all? Um, <laughs> I think so. But, but, but branching off what Jen said, uh, not all at once, just that it's, it's a pendulum, you choose. 
you choose at any given point. And, um, and I think you can have it all if you get, if you eliminate feelings like unnecessary guilt, to be honest, I, I think, um, always, always trying to be a perfectionist and get high marks on everything is just once you accept that that's not going to be the truth, that's not realistic, you, you suddenly become a lot more settled and appreciate what you have accomplished and what you do have and what you're grateful for. Kind of shifting your mindset to what is your definition of having it all is it's not perfection It's you know, having it all is um, relative, I think. Maybe I should define having it all. I, I think we all, uh, for me, I'm a traditionalist, um, family, career, um, you know, well-being of myself, my kid, my husband, and um, everyone's flourishing in the potential that we're given and to cultivate them and our contribution to the society. And we only have 24 hours how much can we stretch and not to have some part of our life to be sacrificed yeah thank you so much Shirley, for the question and uh, i think uh from the sharing right now jen kim olivia we all agree that uh, we believe that you don't need to sacrifice anything unless you define what exactly do you want to focus on so there are no specific limitations uh limitations and limits are in your head but you do need to decide what are the top things that you focus on right now thank you very much for your question it was awesome and let's move on Thanks, to Shirley. june thank you Shirley. um june you're next let's make sure that we are keeping our question uh through about like 30 seconds so that all uh panelists actually have uh, an opportunity to comment and we are uh, able to bring in even more people from the audience on stage thank you very much please go ahead thanks ashley um thanks all the moderators to host this event um actually i'm super happy to see kim and jen finally you know to finally be on the stage and share your story um because i am personally um so i'm 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 currently an investment banker but on the side i'm starting up a brand uh everyday jewelry brand that's affordable um so i guess just a quick question um like how do you for, for such an unknown brand yet like what's the quickest way to kind of get to the um your target market so it's it sounds like a very big question but i do have my uh target markets in mind i i think i will start from you know hong kong taiwan and also you know gradually i think if um if i can i would i would like to extend to southeast asia rather than mainland china for now because of my products i know that um it may not be in the flavor for Chinese market yet. So this is my target market. Um, so definitely starting from brands, I think these are the, um, the easiest way. But upon that, um, how to really reach more audience um, that, you, uh, that, you know, that will suit your brands and also uh, just kind of uh, expand beyond. Thank you. Hey, Jun, can I ask a follow up on um, how yes. many customers have you had so far? No, I'm I'm just launching it, so I think it's a really gotcha. super advanced um question. Yeah, gotcha. So I think the 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 phasing of it matters a lot. And when um when I went through five hundred startups, one of the uh, coaching that really like cemented in my mind was be high touch with your first uh, 1000 customers, especially when it comes to consumer. I think if it's B2B and SaaS, then that number uh, differs slightly. Um, but the reason why I say that is that you're and, and being focused on maybe even just potentially one geo because you only have so much time in the day. And I think splitting into more geos actually make your job much more challenging. But the first 1,000 customers are the ones that will likely make and shape your brand, your offering, your service tonality, um, the kinds of teammates that you need to hire to serve them. And rather than, um, or at least I'm of the camp of, you know, rather than buying uh, social media ads to just sell to a bunch of strangers that you don't have any connections with, it's actually going out to whether it's doing um, community events, um, uh, uh, trade shows, if you will, uh, when they come back uh, in session um, and being really high touch so that you ultimately have that relationship in order to get that feedback from those types of customers and, and, and really um, structure or mold your business according to your first 1,000 customers uh, feedback um, if you're in the consumer space. Yeah, that and sounds very useful. 
in June, just to share a bit of my learnings, because I came from a finance background, did investment banking, and even worked at a hedge fund, and then moved into marketing. I there's so much you can learn. Um, actually, on Clubhouse, I know I keep promoting Clubhouse, but there's so much. There's so many great groups on direct to consumer and uh, marketing, and to get an understanding of what that mix is. Um, I know Jen was talking about kind of those early things at scale to get feedback from the customer, but then there's also understanding, okay, how much should I be putting into Facebook? How much should I be doing with YouTube influencers? How much should I be doing, you know, even with with, with other newer formats? So, so I think. There's an incredible um, resource, and it, it does take some like I know there's a lot of signal to noise in podcast or in um in Clubhouse where it's hard to find the good rooms, but uh, I there there's a lot of incredible entrepreneurs on here who've, who've kind of scaled these whether it's jewelry or other direct to consumer businesses, and I think it's definitely worth exploring more. Um, my understanding, and in the Hong Kong and Taiwan markets, it is quite heavy on. Facebook and and even YouTube is an incredible resource, and uh, you really got to talk to the experts. And I'm afraid since I mostly focus on China, um, I don't know those platforms as well. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Um, actually, I do think you know I do my what you um and Jen's been doing you know in your previous experience and current ones. So I I will actually you know if you guys have time, I would love to join any future um you know uh, KOL marketing whether it's China or like, um. Ex- excluding China, I, I would be interested to join. Thank you so That's much. That's phenomenal. For Thank you so much, June. And this is exactly the right time to remind everybody in the audience to follow our phenomenal moderators and speakers on stage today. And if you follow them with a bell, you will be notified next time they are speaking or hosting a room. And as Kim mentioned, uh, Clubhouse is a great place to learn. There are so many um, amazing conversations happening here. And one of the best ways to sort out which ones you know are interesting, just follow the right people, right? You enter the room, you hear an interesting person follow this person, uh, most likely he or she will bring you more interesting conversations, rooms and contacts. Thank you so much, June. We are moving on to Kanata. How are you? Hello, Ashley. Thank you. Um, my name is Kanata. Nice to meet everyone here. And thank you for the opportunity to be up on stage. So um, I'll jump to my question quickly. Um, right now, I'm working for a payment solutions company um, focusing on financial institutions. And um, we actually just about time of uh, COVID-19 spreading, we had planned initially to target on expanding to new markets and also to growing our business in China as well. So um, uh, we used to have a lot of uh, business trips and um, going into each countries and regions to help support our partners and understand the um, local needs and demand uh, and the behavior and how do we market um, and do our strategies in each market. So my question is, um, uh, with with the situation right now, uh, that um, in some countries that we are totally new to, um, for example, we've never done business in Philippines or with a partner in Philippines before, and another country is Indonesia that we just started. So um, uh, what what are your suggestions in um, gaming uh, with this kind of circumstance. Thank you. Hey, Kanatha, can I clarify? Um, do you mean it's uh, like, how do you navigate cross-cultural BD specifically or? Um, uh, yeah, part of it is how do you navigate? We actually have uh, the direction planned, but now that we we cannot do as uh, what we plan for to go direct and have um, insights there so instead of that now we have to hire some local partner researchers and do some market research um from from the on and based totally online so um i i would like to hear from you guys if there's any um suggestions on other methods that we can add in um, I think from experience, at least on the countries that you've called out specifically, um, this might sound strange, but, but again, it, it, it's such a broad stroke. It depends on your industry and, and, and your partner and clients' industries as well. But I've had um, quite a bit of success in the past with Philippines and Indo actually doing BD via Instagram. 
Um, that was more on B2B sales, if you will. Um, and the team would actually hit up uh, the head of sales on IG because in those countries it is so widely used. Um, and then the resource that I was going to share was um, there's this book called When Cultures Collide. Um, it's a pretty thick read, but it's a great reference for you to kind of just foot by country basis where um, it would actually communicate, let's say, for the Philippines. Um, these are the communication cues. These are the trigger words. This is how they negotiate. Um, this is how they experience power. Um, and, and it was a really helpful manual, actually, by the time when we did get a lead to then also kind of change how we uh, engage with that party as relevant to the cultural lens. Um, but I'm not sure if that's uh, answering your question in that, you know, I think online reaching out, um, you'd be surprised even in, in, in channels like uh, I think IGDM, um, we've seen some success in the past. Uh, yeah, actually, our, our business is mainly B2B. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll look into that. Thank you so much, Jen. Thank you so much for your question. This is awesome. Let's move on. And we have Dr. Wen with, with us here. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you, Ashley. And it's because of the name and also because of name of China and women I joined this room. Amazing. Um, I'm actually a professor of uh, marketing and uh, I do a lot of coaching. Um, and especially I do a lot of executive training, uh, both in Canada and also especially in China. I do bilingual. So, so uh, I want to, first of all, concur. A lot of things you said about uh, leader, leadership in these entrepreneurs, um, women entrepreneurs, I want to say the story is um, they do want it all. And uh, within, maybe we think it's a cultural constraint in many ways about the expectation of women, but they somehow engineer and code that uh, cultural expectation into who they are. And as a result, they're much more resilient. And uh, of course, a lot of times for me, it is really heartbreaking to see how hard they try. But um, in Anyway, so that's the first comment. I, I love this room. And the second point is actually a question and a discussion related to, I mean, the topic digital China. Um, I do want to say is that um, um, the room like this is very important because a lot of Chinese companies and enterprises uh, want to sell their products and, and move their brands to uh, overseas. Um, and uh, especially, I mean, in North America and, and also in other parts of the world. I, I think they have some success, um, largely in Africa, in um, Southeast Asia, but the challenge is always in some other market, which um, there are more cultural dis dissimilarities uh, rather than similarities. So, um, so a lot of questions they ask is, um, you know, how do they move? How do they sell, especially in these online at Amazon, um, you know, also social media? Um, how do they really effectively, the, the, the word that in Chinese is almost like a transport, transport these products and, and brands uh, to overseas markets. Um, so especially in the digital era, um, I want to, there was so much Chinese discussions and there's a lot of bilingual Chinese, they work here in North America, but I, I really wonder um, what's your take on this and your personal experience of um, encountering or consumer Chinese product, consuming Chinese products or Chinese brands online. What are the tips that you would like to give to the Chinese companies um, that who may have already started selling in Amazon, but again, Amazon's brand name is eclipsing these brands, right? Amazon is a platform. So I think right. this is a struggle um, overall. I, I don't, I mean, I'm going to have a room and I struggle too. I'm so sorry. I always want an English room. And ironically, if I do English room, either there is no uh, English speaking people or there is no Chinese people. So it's just a small bilingual group. So I, I think in this room of this kind is very important. Sorry, the question is a bit long. I don't have an answer, but um, I think it's great questions they're asking. Thank you again. I'm done speaking. So there are examples of Chinese brands who have gone global quite successfully. And in many ways, those brands aren't even known as Chinese brands. And um, the examples I'm thinking of are in the fast fashion space. Um, there's, um, I don't know if it's Shine or Sheen, it's S-H-E-I-N and Zaful, Z-A-F-U-L. Sheen. Sheen, Sheen, thank you. And they, um, they adopted you know, what I consider classic influencer marketing practices. 
um, what what's used in China and what's used globally in terms of really massive high scale product seeding with YouTubers um, and Instagrammers and you know that we're talking like billion dollar revenue businesses that are straight you know from shipping from China to U.S. Europe etc. So. I, I do I do see and um, sitting at where my company Park Loose sits, we do get a lot of Chinese um, domestic brands who want to go global. And a number of times it's a matter of, okay, do they have the team? Do they have, um, you know, are they, you know, really going to invest in the sort of the product market fit to adapt to, to uh, you know, the, the kind of, whether it's branding on Amazon that's required or branding on the direct to consumer side. Um, so that that's where we see there is a big gap in terms of the partners to help them fulfill that. But every now and then you you find ones like Shane where it's incredible. And Olivia, sorry. Yeah, Olivia, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to note um, DJI is another great example. I think they're probably a little bit more well known that they are a, a Chinese brand, um, but that's another I think great case study of a, a Chinese brand going abroad. I think Kim also mentioned this, but the teams. So a lot of Chinese brands run into trouble when they're trying to go abroad because of the way that they actually structure the teams and the decision making. Um, so that's a huge, I think, element of success. Yeah, I totally agree with Olivia. I think if it's um, overseas or returning Chinese, there, at least from the VC side of things, I see that there's um, a real yearn for talents who are Chinese but uh, culturally uh, savvy for overseas as well to help lead a lot of these like too high companies to go overseas from China. And I, I feel like I've quoted this uh, particular resource quite a bit recently, but bear with me. The The site is called brandstar.com.cn. I'm in no way affiliated with them. I'm just a big fan of the founder. We, we are wondering now, Jen, I've heard you at least three <laughs> times mentioning them. I'm <laughs> seriously wondering. <laughs> um, seriously, no, no affiliation. I'm just a big fan of their work and, and how genuine they are and in educating everyone about D2C space. Um, so for anything D2C China, I just I point directly to them. But jokes aside, they have a, a URL, they have a, a, a paid membership app as well as a very thriving WeChat community. And actually in there, you'd be able to see a whole list of resources for agencies in Shenzhen that specialize um, taking Chinese brands overseas um, via Shopify, Amazon, Facebook, uh, IG, you name it. And then also founders who are building too high D2C uh, projects. So when you look through those uh, pitch decks and, and databases, I, I would actually say there's no shortage of those projects, but rather to Olivia's point, it, it's the team makeup um, consistent of the right language, cultural um, and business acumen to win overseas, which is totally different playbook to uh, how they would have won China. I want to thank you so much. I, I just, if you, if possible, you can maybe um, um, follow me because I, I really think we should do a bilingual room and the knowledge that you share here, I think are so important. Um, but I'll, I think it's somehow it's a loss in translation in a way that there are not a lot of bilingual Chinese. And I think people like us could be a good bridge. And there is one of the rooms um, that is done in a bilingual way. So if you can speak Chinese, that's perfect. And I think even the title of the room, if it's in Chinese language, or bilingual, I, I think you guys a lot of a lot of it's going to have a lot of following if if uh, somehow the knowledge here can be channeled in a bilingual way. So I really um, appreciate uh, the help, Janet particularly. Um, I'm going to check out that uh, URL and I recommend it to the Chinese Thank friends. Thank you. On, on I'm looking at it now. It's a great website. Yeah. <laughs> it is one awesome website. We are all fans right now. Jen, you're going to earn uh, a lot of commission. <laughs> Hey, if they can collaborate yeah, with, oh, with yeah. Olivia, oh, yeah. with, 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 with Kim, with your KOL businesses, totally see it. <laughs> That's gorgeous. Thank you so much for, for the question. And uh, let's definitely connect uh, outside of Clubhouse uh, to chat more. And uh, this is almost time. I would like to ask our remaining amazing ladies on stage, first of all, the audience, 
Make sure, guys, that you are following these phenomenal women uh, with a bell so that you're notified when they are hosting rooms, not only on China, digital China, but also on uh, entrepreneurship, leadership, mindset, um, uh, investment, um, and all those topics around their professional and personal expertise. So uh, to close this room, and before Jennifer takes over with her magical way to close the room, I would like to ask one last question. What would be your advice to all those leaders and entrepreneurs um, in doubt at the beginning of their journey, in the middle of their journey? What was that one thing that actually moved you forward in your professional career fastest. What is that one thing, advice, the secret that really helped you most? Who wants to share their secret? Kim, go for it. <laughs> ah, Kim, go for it. <laughs> uh, you know how they say behind every successful man, there's, there's a strong woman? Well... <laughs> In my case, I know I'm where just, you're going with this. <laughs> well, I'm just saying I, I have a great um, life partner. I, it's, it's ironic because my fiance, then husband at the time when I started Park Blue, actually managed to question and doubt my decisions for three straight years before he finally got on board. But it was really healthy. I'm going to tell you this. It was really healthy. It helped me um, uh, be self-aware, aware of my own biases, my decision-making pitfalls. And through it all, the fact that I could finally convince him after three plus years was just allowed me to double down in the business. So I, I don't know, for what it's worth, for, for me, it's, it's that um, you can't do it alone and you, you got to have those pillars in your life. So that's my secret. Nobody else wants to share this. I was looking at Jennifer's mic. I was like, oh, maybe she's coming back. <laughs> um, I was just clapping. I was just listening <laughs> to you guys and clapping. <laughs> um, I'll keep her short. Um, for me, it's uh, learning how to meditate, learning to read more, um, and also just finding a coach. Um, and, and we are very blessed, I think, in China where there's so many... Um, wonderful women entrepreneurs who've paved the way and and, and and therefore I think it's quite easy to look up and, and find women whom you want to learn from which I understand may not be the luxury in certain other geos but um there's a there's an app that I've used before called coach called coach hub um not it, it's quite a good resource for anyone that you know if, if, if for whatever reason you can or, or identify a coach in your direct network um the technology solution of it provides another avenue um, to actually work with a professional coach um, at a cadence that suits you. And, you know, it's like going to the gym. You probably can't hit your next weight class just trying and trial and error uh, on your own without the help of a personal trainer to really guide you, set you on a right plan, measure your progress, and then celebrate your success. And for me, uh, finding a coach, be it online or in your direct communities, um, really, really, really supercharged my growth. Super good advice, Jen. Um, I think mine would be that you're never going to get to a point where all of your problems are solved. You're just going to get better at solving problems faster. Um, I think I had the, the belief that like, okay, once I get to this point, things are going to be so much easier. Once I do this, once I get achieve that, you know, life is going to, I'm going to have so much more time. That is absolutely not the case ever. Once you solve something, once you get to a certain level, there's going to be bigger um, and better problems and challenges to solve. So you just can't get overwhelmed um, and can't have the mindset of like, it's not getting over the hill. You just have to learn how to keep climbing for longer. I'm just remembering how Ashley was saying, um, you know, shake that ass is what she has. <laughs> she, she does to like keep moving during the day. Um, my, I guess my secret is that um, I like to collect, uh, this sounds bad, I like to collect my friends and uh, people from like different walks of life and kind of bring them together. So one of the things that really held it together for me during the pandemic um, was actually, you know, I've been having weekly Zooms with some of my friends. Um, so some are from high school, some are from college, some are from MBA, uh, some are, uh, but, but like, 
it's actually it sort of grew out of um, uh, a new initiative um, from my, I partnered up with my friend who runs Society of Family Offices. And uh, we create a new initiative called Women with Purpose. And so I've been running um, Zooms now weekly. And uh, we can we have sometimes do like really deep dives, like six people workshops, or then we have as much as like, you know, have, have as many as 20 people, for example, like talking about like how we're investing in blockchain or uh, looking at um, diamonds or so, some of them are messaging me right now in the audience guys I'm trying to close the room don't message me right now um, but yeah they um, they they have been actually I feel like by you know how you say it, it, takes, it takes a village to raise a child and sometimes I feel like okay you know all of us are you know sometimes we're living in different places from where we were brought up or born and and yet like you can kind of surround yourself with this virtual village so that's what I've been able to do I mean I do count um um, those of you, um, some of you on stage with me as like, you know, my friends and people that I really look up to. And um, just knowing and being able to share spaces and conversations has really kind of kept me going, like knowing that I have this, you know, this tribe of women. Um, and I know, my, I know it might sound corny, but um, doing things like, hey, you know, we were like joking around, we were writing white papers for each other, or like, hey, it's your turn to host, or hey, um, you know, your turn to take notes. Um, and in a way, it kind of plays into like, you know, sort of peer coaching, peer guiding. And um, I've never done a mastermind, but I guess this might be kind of similar. Um, and that's actually been kind of a big source of support to, for me. Like sometimes we'll even share like silly things like parenting hacks or like, uh, we're actually coming up with a very heavy topic um, in a few weeks, but one is called like, um, you know, COVID divorce, as well as uh, freezing your eggs for the future <laughs> and uh, it's, it's kind of heavy because I, I i didn't realize that all of us would want to discuss things like this but we do this is beautiful uh so secrets were shared mine apart from those that were mentioned i think the um, um thing that i'm using quite often and i see i see it making an incredible impact is um just acting and acting fast so if I thought of something in the morning, I'm going to execute it in the afternoon. And uh, that I think is the power of uh, also being an entrepreneur and leader. So if I thought of a new, I do not know, way to, as Kim mentioned earlier uh, today, there's a new book you read yeah, about hiring. And now you have a completely different idea. Oh, how to hire people and how to evaluate them, etc. So thought of it in the morning, execute in the afternoon without a gap right away, implement, roll out. And that, um, you know, that probably comes also from years living in mainland China and working with that market because it's a China speed on steroids and uh, you are succeeding faster and you're failing fast and then you're doing things better if you failed the first time so either way i believe that this just do it attitude is also very very helpful